Good afternoon, I'm Shannon Derejo. Welcome to today's webinar on systemic change and ESG, hosted on behalf of ESG Africa Conference and Expo and sponsored by EY. This webinar will explore how systemic change can help your work as an ESG practitioner. It's become apparent in today's complex and interconnected world that working in silos no longer gives us the transformative change we need. It's critical to look holistically at issues understand all the moving parts and co-create solutions that take the relevant ecosystem into consideration, which is particularly important in Africa. Our panelists will unpack how systemic change can enhance your ESG efforts, the pitfalls to avoid and key lessons to learn. Before we start, please note that the chat and the Q&A are available to you. Please post your questions in the Q&A and your comments in the chat. Both the Q&A and the chat are at the bottom of your screen. Please be aware that we are recording this webinar and we'll send the recording to you when it's available. We're also streaming the webinar live on YouTube and we'll share the link in the chat. I'd like to introduce today's moderator, Wendy Poulton. She's the Director of Strategic Mindsets, a company specializing in strategy and risk consulting and coaching. She's also the co-founder of the ESG Africa Conference and Expo. Wendy will facilitate the discussion with today's panel, which consists of Marie Paramon Gurney, CEO and Chief Transformation Impact Officer at Sculpture, Sharon van Skulkbeek, Executive Director at Ubuntu Lab Institute, and Nicola White, Strategy and Transaction Sustainability at EY Parthenon. I'll hand over now to moderator Wendy Poulton to start the discussion. Over to you, Wendy. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Shannon, and welcome to everybody. It's my great pleasure to facilitate this panel because it really is one of my passions. I've had over 25 years in sustainability and, as Shannon said, strategy and risk as well. And the more that you work in these fields together with people who are their own, uh, the people that drive systemic change, um, the more you realize that unless we take a systemic view on today's extremely fast changing and uncertain VUCA world that we live in, we're not going to be able to implement all of those great things that we come up with in strategy. And so it really is a critical issue for something like ESG, which is got to be integrated into that, that particular system. So we're very lucky to have the panel that we have today to discuss these things. You also share my passion for this topic. And um, I think we're going to jump right into it and ask the first question, which is we know that systemic change is important for ESG for the reasons that I just mentioned. But why is it so important for Africa in particular that we, we look at things from a systemic point of view? So, Marie, I will start uh, with you. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. And, and really, like, it's a privilege to be in this web on this webinar. Uh, as you know, it's also one of my passions, system change and transformative approach to sustainability. And, and I think, the, to me, there is two reasons about why is it important for Africa. The first reason is term of our development path. And if we want to make sure that our development path address uh, values consideration, economic growth or development, resilience of that economic growth, first of all, and but also the inclusive uh, social development and the regenerative approach to our natural capital, and to make sure that we do it in an innovative way and really optimize on the different aspects of our development from a social and environmental perspective. The only way to do it is to look at it from a system change perspective. Everything is connected. And what I found way to explain it really well is if you look at agriculture. Agriculture is about food system, it's about survival of people, but it's also about economic growth, it's also about economic development, it's about infrastructure, it's about banking, it's about insurance, it's about health, it's about nutrition, it's about so many things. And so if you only look at it from one aspect, then you can't optimize opportunity from a business, from an ESG perspective, and you can't really develop an ESG approach that is actually adding all the value together. So to me, it's a it's a non-brainer and it's the only way to look at it from a business perspective. Thank you. Uh, Nicola, yes. your um, thoughts on this? On, on systemic change in Africa. 
What is yes. really why is it important specifically for Africa? Yeah. What is really interesting uh, in uh, about it is that Africans are, are often quite early on in their ESG journeys. That requires you to come into a company and really educate everybody what it's about. We're building dynamic flow models so they can understand how the supply chain may impact the rest of the business and how it's eventually going to work through from an operations perspective, dealing with all your waste and your biodiversity all the way up into revenue, revenue generation. But what is critical now is all the funding coming into Africa from Europe has to obey, abide by the SFDR regulations. And these regulations are quite tough. They require enormous reporting, um, uh, uh, reporting standards that are very well aligned to TCFD and GRI and all the SASB related things. So looking at how Africans can embrace them, you have to, you have to look at from a systemic uh, approach because Nobody wants to uh, sort of put ESG activities in, in place that are just compliance driven. They have to be value accretive. Now, you can't create the value or understand the value creation opportunities without understanding its impact throughout the organization, throughout the income statement and the balance sheet and the cultural perspective of what's needed to embrace and adopt these new activities and principles. Thanks. Thank you so much. And I think you raised a really important point there around um, making sure that the, the change is linked to not only regulation and those kinds of changes that are happening, but to value creation in the organization. Um, and so without doing it systemically, you're not you're going to miss some opportunities um, because you're looking at things from too narrow a perspective. And so thanks for raising that. And, you know, for me, it's also really, really critical in Africa that if you don't take a systemic approach, you miss out on the social side, which is the most important thing in Africa, social upliftment, poverty alleviation, all of those issues as well. So that's a different kind of value that you're mentioning there as well. Um, Nicola, um, sorry, uh, Sharon, do you want to add anything on this point before we go on to the next question? Thanks, Wendy. I'll be short. Um, just speaking from the perspective of Ubuntu Lab's work and the Presencing Institute, um, which is all about systems change. And the thought, looking at it from the iceberg way, as we often have an iceberg thing to explain many things, what we see at the uh, above is not what is causing what we see. So everything, the reality that is at the top, and we and we continuously create systems that deliver what we don't want. Um, we don't get up in the morning to decide to create chaos, but we have created chaos. And below the surface is the other structures and the systems um, that are, is creating our reality. And unless we go into the systems and understand what is feeding that, we can't really change our reality. And I think for um, you talking about uh, the different systems, really, there's we looking at environments so the whole ecological divide, the social divide that you've just mentioned now, uh, the fact of the inequality that exists. Um, and I think why specifically Africa, we've got a slightly additional element to looking at our systems, is the, the impact on just our Africanness um, because of colonization and uh, you know what's come to us through patriarchy and unfortunately also religions, where the identity of Africans, we've lost that, we don't know who we are, and we've we've adopted systems that in Africa, across the continent, that are not, not ours. It's not the way Africans indigenously lived and lived, including with nature as well. So the concept of Ubuntu, including nature. So the, the whole systems, looking at the systems in Africa has got that slight extra ele element of which of these systems actually belong to us and what has cause some of the chaos because it's not the way we operate and it's created um, some of the stuff that we don't want. 
Thank you so much, Sharon. I think it was really insightful around, you know, it's not just one system, it's lots of interlinked systems. And oftentimes when we do the analysis, we've got to be careful that we don't, because you can just go broader and broader, right? So it's focusing in on what are the things that, as Nicola said, are really going to create the value for you as an organization. So thank you for that. So I'd like us to then sort of move on to where some examples that we've got in Africa where we've applied this type of systemic approach, really analyzed the system and got benefit from doing that. So, so we can help um, the people on, the, uh, on this webinar to understand some of the hows. How do you actually do this? It sounds very complicated, but it's not really when you, when you get to understand it. So what are some great examples that we've got there? So um, Sharon, I'll start with you um, because you also, and if you could just touch a little bit on some of the skills that you need to do this as part of that how. Thank you, Wendy. Um, yes, I think we, we uh, I will, um, from our perspective, we work very much on the on the personal how. Uh, I think Maria and Nicola might have better examples from the bigger systems. Um, because the systems need to change from below and above. There's definitely the systems that keep things out of, like, you know, like keeping people out of the market. So let me give you a, a small, very practical uh, example uh, in Zambia. Um, where the banking system, well, it's an African thing, where the banking system really keeps people out of the system if they don't have assets. If you don't have an asset, you can't really borrow. So um, in, some, in Zambia, some women got together and they started a village bank, which is fairly much what we would understand as a stock fell. Um, but in their system, you it's just again saving together but then people have to borrow uh, so that it it um creates a financial system and growing um within that sort of context um i think uh, um, another good example um trying to think now of the practical ones that are maybe slightly bigger level as um, one of our groups in Uganda has decided to to tackle integrity as a value in the country system. So they have got together and they are meeting with government um, and being involved with bringing integrity into all the pieces of work that they do into working with school children, et cetera, et cetera. So it can be Working within the systems can be at very low levels, but creating a different uh, way of being. Another sh quick example are the, the experiences of women of not getting good service from service providers. So in this one community, they've uh, created a Facebook group where they post all women service providers and all other companies that are gender, gender sensitive in providing service. So, you know, that kind of idea could be replicated in all sorts of aspects. So these are mm. like examples are now from, you know, community type systems and how we start bringing to reality things based on values that are more sustainable or more nourishing and more, of the kind of thing that we want for our future. Hmm. Thank you, Sharon, for those examples. Nicola, did you have others that you wanted to add? Yeah, I mean, I can talk very broadly and don't don't want to mention any particular client. But all of us sitting on the on 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 this webinar, we all understand what E, S, and G are. Data is clearly everything when trying to measure and understand what's important for your ESG. We all understand you can't do everything. You need to find out what your material, material factors are and focus on those. But what's deeper and even better beyond that is you're looking at systemic factors like do you have strategic resilience embedded in how you've designed your governance systems? Are you looking at your IT and your data security to understand 
what they need to do to be flexible and adaptable and adopt some of the ESG principles or activities you, you want to be in. Then you've got to look at your financial structures. How are you organizing your financial and your operational structures and assets in order to, in, in order to, to really understand how all of those must get the agility they need, how you are devolving power and data gathering responsibilities down to people on the floor so that you can gather everybody into this entire structure of ESG and creating value. It all has to be tied together. The cyber, the operational, the financial, the strategic, the governance structures, get them to work in a management system that empowers people, that teaches people what they're trying to do, that uh, that you, you really need to teach them how, how what data points, what the value is in the data point. Does it really matter that I'm measuring this particular data point unless you, you educate them what the analytical value of that data point is for, let's say, third parties or for their own business? It's very difficult to really pull the value out. Now, everybody really want, is looking at, at ESG as a, it's a compliance thing and it's a cost thing. The only way we are going to generate a groundswell of acceptance is by proving that it's value accretive. And it's that, therefore, you need to look at it in a far bigger way than just E, S, and G. Look at all the bits and pieces that go into it from a systemic or a business-wide perspective. Essentially, that's my example. And that's how we tend to approach all the companies we're looking at, whether it's right from the beginning on the gap analysis, what you're missing, or benchmarking them. But you need to establish a rapport with your companies that you're working with in order to understand the nuts and bolts of their operations and how they actually function so that you can fit ESG activities into it seamlessly and pull as much value as you can out. Thanks. Nicola, can I push you a little bit? You, yeah, you said can. sort of some of the major learnings. What in your experience have you seen that hasn't worked? What didn't work and what can we learn from that? What have people tried in the way that they implement systemic thinking? And so, then it's been a miserable failure, so we know what to avoid. <laughs> so often people find it really, really hard to give up power, you know, to allow to, uh, to allow a, an additional, you know, lower levels of, in the organization to say these people actually have the on-the-ground knowledge of what is happening with a manufacturing plant. How often are you talking to them? Do you believe what they're saying? So creating forums, so that is difficult to do to, to devolve power downwards. What is also quite difficult to do is, is to change, you know, governance structures that have been operational for like 20 years. How, how, how do you help companies understand that the kind of things they're doing are maybe not working in the best way possible? So anything that involves change to a system as in any system takes time and effort to implement. And, you know, sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. <laughs> um, those are the biggest learnings. It's change and it's, and, it, and it's trying to get, let's say, executive management to understand the change and not take it as a, as a knock to their ego when you suggest that they be, maybe, you know, they can consider it looking at the other, at the other way. Because if you want to get buy-in, you have to get executive management to back you all the way through, even if that involves, you know, difficult for things for management to accept. That's that's the hard side of it. Oh, thank you. That I think that's great uh, information for people as well. I mean, I think certainly um, you have to get buy-in at the upper levels, but you also have to get buy-in at the lower levels where you're implementing the, the issues. So what you're saying about, you know, right throughout the organization is is so, so important. And that co-creation that Shannon was talking about right in the beginning, um, which gets buy-in as well. So I think one of the things I've seen people not do very well is consult with people and get that buy-in early on and use the co-creation. In our last uh, session that Marie facilitated in our community of practice, um, we were talking about the power of co-creation and how you know important it is. So, Marie, you've already mentioned one example on agriculture. Um, do you have any others that you think will help us? And I know at the Community of Practice next week we're going to delve 
a lot more into the how and some of the practicalities around that. But any other examples of where you've really seen this working in Africa? So I think where there's been an attempt for it, um, it started as an environmental issue. So everyone is aware about our plastic uh, challenge. So that, that became like more a visual thing. It was there. There was a strong policy and a regulatory framework. So there was a lot of push from the NGO. But there also was an understanding we're facing a problem around plastic. Um, and then in the South Africa context and, and in many other Euro, uh, African contexts, um, there was a regulatory push with what we call the extended responsibility, producer responsibility. But what happened with that is, so you have the compliance push, but then is how do we make it work? Because it's one thing to say you are responsible for the plastic that you produce throughout the life cycle, but that's where you need to understand that that's where system change approach become really important because you can't save that issue on your own. Plastic is all entire supply chain. Um, and also when you position it in, African context, there is all secondary economies that rely on the current context. So there was a very strong intentionality with the role player um, when the legislation was coming to say, how do we organize ourselves? And so there was uh, a lot of thinking about mapping the system, understanding who is involved, who is doing what, what are the gap. And I think one of the big elements of this was to spend and have a bit more time. And I'm not saying that's a perfect example, but it was a try at it to say, do we understand the problem? Because it's one thing to say we have a plastic problem. It's another thing to say, why do we have it? And where are the different points of intervention where we can achieve the objective of reducing plastic waste? And so there were different avenues um, to change and to address the issue, which was for minimizing, reducing, looking at technology innovation, looking at collaboration, but also looking at the all social aspect of it. And that became something really big in South Africa. So we had different stakeholders, and that's where your, your co-creation become really important, Wendy, is bringing everyone to really have a diverse perspective of the problem, to then be able to say, okay, these are the options, and then it was like, how do we experiment? Because one of the things that we do often is here in ESG is we're very quick to jump to the solution. We're like, oh, we have a water issue. We have a plastic issue. This is a solution, and it's A to B. It's a straight line. Well, I think we all there on this call able to say, well, if we if that was that simple, we will not be here and we will not be having this discussion and it will not be such a big issue. Because when you speak about environmental issue, you are sp you're actually talking about economic market. And so it was, a very, I think, I think the plastic discussion that has taken place in South Africa, and it's not, we haven't sorted it out, but the discussion that took place were completely different. And I think another example where you saw that was the, self-created ecosystem of company during COVID. I think that's really where we saw uh, and a remarkable attempt to say we're having a problem and take really a lot of time to experiment, not knowing exactly how we, and creating that space for experimentation to address a social challenge. And I think that was some, and, and, and the beauty of system change, which is a nightmare for company, is system change is about experimenting, failing, learning, and going again. So the IT guys understand this. We have not got that narrative in sustainability. We think that we need to have that solution and it has to work and that's it. Mm. Thank you. Those are great examples. And I think that causality that you're talking about as well really helps you understand that system and what's driving it and not just focusing on the outcomes, but the real root cause that you were mentioning there as well. And what that, that's a very nice segue into the next thing I want to discuss, which is around the stakeholder analysis, which all of you have mentioned um, at, in different parts of your responses, um, and the fact that the systemic um, change normally, I mean, it can't, doesn't have to, but for big things, it's, it's managing stakeholders not only internally but also externally to your organisation on your supply chain, regulators, local communities, all of those kinds of things as well. So if we're going to take this approach of systemic change to be more resilient, as Nicola was saying, how do we need to change the way in which we identify and engage with our stakeholders? So, um, Marie, can I start with you on that one? Yeah, but I, I need to control myself because this is obviously my passion. So I uh, know that's why I asked you to go first. <laughs> but I, I will. I, 
And I think it's also understanding why do you engage with stakeholders, first of all, and be very, 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 very transparent about it. If you just want to consult with them, say we just want to consult with them. But if you authentically want to start a co-creation process to really enrich and take a system approach to your ESG, that's a completely different process. And you need to understand what it means. And I think Nicola mentioned about power. And so First of all, you need to understand who are your stakeholders, as you mentioned, Wendy. And, and that mapping is not about, oh, this is our client, this is our, obviously you do the normal, but it's about who's got influence and power, what are their interests, how do you impact on them, but how do they impact on you? Uh, what are their pain and their gain through what you're doing, your services, your product, but also your presence in the landscape? So it's a geographic presence. It, it's understanding who can help you in your ESG journey because it doesn't have to be an individual company. It's more about who can work with you in a landscape. It's about also understanding what, how do you want to engage them and what do you want for them? So it's a different type of communication. But if you start a co-creation process, you have to really be understanding of what you are willing to show when you start the process and being clear about the intent. But understand then that you will not on what is the outcome of this because that's a beauty of a co-creation process. And often I see a lot of company bring the, their usual suspects. So they bring to co-creation process the people that they like working with. And it's great and it's a good start and no one has to go around transformative stakeholder and engagement and co-creation. But if you are willing to really expand your, your product and your services and how you're showing up as a company, when you bring a more diverse group of stakeholders and even maybe competition or, or people that, that you don't normally kind of engage, but have an interest based on your, on your mapping, that's where the magic happens because you start really enriching that understanding of how can you add value and impact? Because it's not just your linear thinking of what you know how to do. You bring other expertise, you bring other reality, other perspective, other skills. Uh, and then and then and then what is important is you all agree about what is your co-shared vision. So what's emerging from you are wanting to work together and then allow, and I'm you're all going to try to think that I'm like just counting my our services, but allow someone to facilitate this process for you because then you stand as a normal stakeholders within your own ESG journey. And what happened when that app when that, what, what happened when that take place is innovation, is creativity. And 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 what we've seen is that it it's it kind of starts changing your product and your services and your positioning with the market. And then you start also doing bundling of services with others that you never thought about. And so it's not about just your ESG journey from a CSI or CSR perspective. It's about developing offerings that are relevant to other people that you never thought about. So I'm going to stop here, even if I get a lot to say. <laughs> I'm gonna say yeah, I so love you it. <laughs> You've raised a number of issues there. So the other issue that we really have to think about in systemic uh, planning and thinking about is um, diversity and inclusion to get different ideas, but also that it's not easy, right? Because it's a different way of doing things. And if you go to your exco and say, I need you to be here for a whole day to talk about with stakeholders about what we could potentially do and co-create, they'll probably, you know, like throw their hands up in horror. So it's 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 not an easy process, but if you start small and get some wins, you can show people the value of doing it. Then it mm -hmm. can really um, give you exponential um, value from that. So, sorry, Nicola, do you want to add something on that? Uh, no, I was just um, enjoying uh, Wendy's passion. Wendy, can I say something? Yes, of course. Um, yeah, just adding actually to the whole, whole flow of the conversation so far. And I, what is important in these, uh, when organizations look at this, is also <laughs> to always look back at themselves. And I think there's there's so much, um, you know, comes back to the egos and all that stuff that we spoke about. And this is the way the system is. And these are stakeholders, as Maurice said, okay, it's those, 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 those. But look back at ourselves and look at who are we not speaking to? What are we not hearing? What are we not aware of? And if the system has to be new, if we want to co-create something new, how would we need to change everything we do potentially? 
and how so, so to change a system you need to change the way people think you need to change the consciousness the awareness so it's not just about changing this to, to get to the systems change we need to go down into people we need to start thinking differently we need to start looking at the world differently and we need to, need to see the people that we didn't see before like nicholas said the people that are left out of the equation um if i example now let's say the social political thing happened in kenya we don't in the political world they don't take the youth seriously but now the youth are say well here we are the youth have now i think thankfully those are the good things some of the systems were you know we don't listen to the youth those are the stories we were told um now the youth are just actually stepping up and the older generation are going to have to say oh okay there's a lot of these young people around <laughs> and they they're actually challenging us and that's um um what needs to come is the, the the openness to be able to say okay maybe what i'm doing is not the right thing anymore it's not the best thing anymore and to move also from all our headspace down to like what is really happening in the broader perspective of the world and what it could be what is that better better place that we can be no well, thank you for that chair and that's a great intervention i mean i think absolutely it's about um <clears throat> questioning where you are all the time because the world is changing so fast if you keep on that same way of thinking you're never going to innovate you always and you could be going down a very dangerous path um, so that brings us nicely into both you and Marie have, have mentioned innovation. So Nicola, do you want to talk a little bit about the role of innovation in all of this and how this links to maybe some of the tools that people can use to get these leaders that we've been talking about or decision makers to think differently? Yes, um, but first I just wanted to give you a practical example on stakeholder engagement. You know, um, before we get into innovation, the stakeholder you'll find stakeholder engagement always sits right at the bottom and it never has an appropriate budget. And very seldomly do companies take stakeholder engagement seriously. Everybody will do a map and, you know, prioritize the stakeholders, but very seldomly are you actually looking at each stakeholder and understanding what their key requirements are, what their key concerns are. And then developing responses from a company's perspective to those to those concerns and, and requirements, not only developing responses, figuring out what communication platform you should use to talk to them, okay, how often you should talk to them, who within the company should talk to them, and what the cultural sensitivities are that you should be aware of. You know, that's that's a basic approach to stakeholder engagement that people must think about it must be done properly because it's it's so easy to hurt yourself by engaging stakeholders incorrectly you can hurt your reputation get all sorts of loads of stuff on social media that you really don't want to deal with if you don't spend time and effort thinking about your stakeholders onto the onto the onto the end of innovation angle you know that's quite hard but not really in esg okay because it all, from my perspective, revolves around the tech you're going to use. If you're looking at innovation, anybody can say we're on a net zero journey. Let me tell you, it's almost impossible to get there. It's extremely difficult. So the innovation that is needed, mostly from a financial perspective, you know, CFOs are not keen on, on, on me saying, Here, will you invest a couple of million on putting solar rooftop on the, on, on the panel? So what we need to demonstrate from the innovative point of view, again, comes down to what are the benefits? Are you doing the right feasibility modeling to understand how you will bring the innovative green tech into your business? And I loved what, uh, what Marie and, and Sharon were saying. The innovation comes into, we call it, we've got a quadrant model where essentially you're looking at all the, the rules, the structures and the processes in product run, it's the housekeeping. Then you begin your stakeholder dialogues and through your stakeholder dialogues with everybody within the entire um, run of your business, 
from shareholders all the way to suppliers. That allows you to really start creating innovative products, innovative go-to-market strategies, innovative branding ideas, and in access to much cheaper forms of capital. So that's how I believe you should use innovation from an ESG perspective with your stakeholders. Make sure you have all your housekeeping and legal things in order. You're ob obeying all your, all your environmental laws and regulations. You're talking to your stakeholders. And through that, and through the correct financial modeling on any uh, serious capex that you might be doing, you, it, you be, you, you're getting into a quadrant where ESG is really adding value. New products, new services, new routes to market, new ways of doing things. That's for me the innovation on that front. Thank you. Um, Sharon or Marie, do you want to add something on innovation? Not on innovation, but I mean, I, I, I suppose it's, it's, I just would like to reflect on one thing that Sharon said is that's all right around the self uh, from, from an ESG and organizational perspective and link it to innovation, actually, if that's all right, Wendy, just, just very quickly. Sure, of course. Uh, I think I think Sharon, that's a super important point, and 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 why I wanted to reflect on it is because I've just been having like two engagement over the last two weeks around this, and so organization going through their ESG or sustainability strategy, and actually looking at what they have achieved and, and being completely honest to say we haven't achieved what we wanted and why, then they start going through a system change assessment of why they haven't. One of the things they found out is that their governance structure and their stakeholder engagement is not fit for purpose to be transformative. What do I mean by this is, as Nicola was mentioning, is they, they're just not applying the, the principle of the engagement process to be transformative and to allow a, pro, a transformative process. And so they are starting now a questioning around their own culture as, a, as an organization. They are questioning the governance system in terms of where do we give the place to our stakeholders? Where give, we give the place to communities, to indigenous communities? I saw your reference to it in the chat box, uh, to the voices that are not there. And how do we start shifting? And Nicola, you use that word power. And how they start shifting influence and power to others. But the reality is, and, and I think we have to be completely honest about this, it's not for every company. And it requires a very strong and intentional leader and leadership team and board to want to do that. And so in terms of the innovation, Wendy, I think what is important is don't start from scratch as a company to do that in your ESG, because that might just not fly. But I think it starts with experimenting around this on one product or on one area. And just as you say, I think, Wendy, you mentioned that, is, is innovate around this and show then back to the board and the leadership team, what was the added value? What did you learn and what is the potential then of scaling? So, uh, but but it starts with you wanting to challenge yourself on the way and on how you're doing this. And it's all about more the process actually than the product and services to start. Mm, thank you, mm -hmm. totally agree. Um, Sharon, did you want to add anything on innovation? Uh, just something short. I, I um... Yeah, it's um, we we need to get to the space of innovation to create a space and a world that's going to be different to this chaos that we can continue to do, and um, and it needs to start here. Uh, I was just trying to think. You talk about ESG, and I think like, how do we think about ESG individually, and how if one, what would a conversation be like in a company? If you, if it was first a personal question in in your role, in your role as personal and work, how does ESG fit into your thinking? Um, and also, she was in a talk last night where a young guy said, "Transformation happens when you take responsibility for yourself." Uh, and I think it's a big thing that we also need to learn is. To, we need to lose the belief of Superman's coming. You know, Superman's not coming. <laughs> Superman is us. And unless yeah. we step up, and that is for every single person in the organization, and we need to let them, people need to feel that empowerment, be able to be able to speak. 
So that comes to the leadership structures where, you know, you can't speak to the boss. Mm. That kind of stuff is to stop. Um, and then innovation is, we obviously learn from history and how things have done, and we need to learn to get, that, get to that next point, that we don't just extract from the past that we need to sit in this space and say, okay, this is what we've learned. And this is the reality that we're in. Now, what might be possible to get to a, a, a different space? And the innovation is almost like thinking from the future rather than thinking from what we know. Yeah, that's so important. And I mean, for human beings, that's so hard because we normally think based and have biases based on our past, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why I was asking about the tools because mm -hmm. using things like teaching people systems diagrams to understand causality, ask questions like what if, uh, what else, you know, so that you expand out your thinking scenarios, those kinds of things, so that people don't take decisions in a simple world, but in this more complex and complicated world. So I think that's such an important point. Thank you for bringing that up. And also the issue around leadership, which is at all levels in the organization, which I think is also really, really important. Um, I wanted us to move on a little bit to start talking about how do we know if we've been successful in implementing <laughs> systemic change? You know, it's nice to talk about it and we have all these nice things and uh, how do we actually measure it? Uh, Nicola, do you want to start? <laughs> yeah, well, it's not easy, and it doesn't happen over you, over a couple of months. When you're measuring this, you need to look at your, and generally, um, it's about two years before you're going to get the data out. So you need to make a long-term commitment to this change, because anything that's large-scale does take time to, it, you know, the data for the data to come out. For example, you know, how many training programs do your employee base need before you can start measuring the productivity improvements you're getting? It's not going to happen within, a, within two or three months. It is going to take you a little bit longer. Um, other elements of success, let's, let's think, you know, if you look at the social aspect, little things like, for example, we were working at um, um, a, 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 a factory up, up in Nigeria that was making beds. And they were having lots of issues with the community that was vandalizing the factory all the time. Lots of employees were late for work. And it was just about looking at this issue and thinking, how what's, what's going on? And the only solution was, we built a bridge over the river so that kids could get to school on time, that people could get to work easily. And all of a sudden, the vandalism problem goes away but you have to engage and understand. So your success in that is not going to be overnight. It does take a few months um, before you start seeing the numbers coming in. Design the data system so that makes it easy for you to gather the data to prove your success, because you're going to need to prove it. And particularly if you're going to get more cash from the CEO to do more and more that you'd like to do. <laughs> get the data. And the data is very hard to do. There are lots of new systems and tools you can use but really, for me, the data is about educating people why, why data is important. So I can't give you lots of successful full, full things, you know, immediately. Take the time to look at how your, your breakages and your theft and your training programs are adding value to your cost lines and to your revenue lines. That's really your, 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 your success measures, put it that way. And Nicola, yeah. how do you measure those social issues that we were talking about earlier that are so important for Africa? Because oftentimes that's not very data-driven um, or it's no, no. soft so, data, it's people's opinions. Yeah. yeah, you do have to do surveys and you have to go and collect the data. Obviously, to calculate impact, we look, we're using a lot of impact multipliers. I don't think the impact multipliers are that great for all parts of Africa. But you do need to you need to use them to create all, all our traditional impact reports that we do use. But if you're looking and you're doing, let's take a big company that has a very large retail base that works across Africa. Let's say distributing goods to all the retailers. You have to go in there and do a study about are my employees earning a living wage? What is happening to the education levels of the children? in the communities that are close to our premises. Are we paying the living wage? 
Are we helping people understand that they shouldn't be doing this and using credit cards or whatever? And you slowly begin to measure your, 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 your education levels of your communities around your operations, things like that. That's how you measure community. You Thank have you. To look order. Thanks very much. Marie or Sharon, do you want to answer on the measurement issue? Any thoughts well, to I, add there? I def definitely, because this is a big one. And and I think I think the measurement issue of ESG is one set um, th that that is as data framework and has a lot of element. But now I'm more interested about how do we demonstrate that we are having the system change that, that we were intending. And yes. and then that one, I think I think Nicola and I and Sharon and you and the we need to sit down because there is there is a lot of like issue around this and and so I, I'm I'm going to try to make it quite um, practical in the sense that we have worked with company where obviously people want data that's a reality we want data because data is able to inform decision and it's able to also it's easy to put it people understand it and I completely agree with this but there are elements of system change where mass system change through the ESG approach is about improving agency of small scale farmer. So I can tell you how much farmer we have impacted, but to tell you the story about how they had improved the agency, it's not a number, it's a story. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that story then will give you more number because it will tell you they were able to engage and negotiate price with the sugar factories that were there. They were supposed to engage with and collaborate and create cooperatives. They were supposed to have access to finance. They were supposed to have more confidence in developing new products. They had skill that enabled them to do. And there is a whole story there that has no number. And my story about this is it got killed by many people in companies. And that's the reality, because I couldn't put a number on it. And they were like, that is too complicated. And I think at the moment, we are having a bit of a pull and push, because ESG is very intensive on number, which I understand. But if we are taking a transformative and system change approach, we need to allow a bit of experimentation about how do we demonstrate that long-lasting impact. So I can create a job. The job is there for two years. I created a job. It's there for two years. I created the ability of someone to either be an entrepreneur or to have the ability to look and feel confident to look for a job once, but not just once, two, three, four times. That's slightly different. And so I think in, in, in and especially in South Africa, we're very quick at creating a, a project that creates jobs. It's not that people get new jobs, it's just the project creates jobs. What is interesting is how do you build the skill and the capacity and the confidence of people to be able to then look for more jobs. And that's just one of the examples. So, so to me is how do we look at new indicators and, and experiment and exchange and learn around this in addition to the one that we have? How do we create story between the different <clears throat> indicators that Nicola, because I love the, the example of the bridge, Nicola. I think that's a perfect one of system change. The, the one indicator is a bridge, but there are so many other numbers and other systemic stories that are coming out of that one bridge that are as important. And, and to me, that's a perfect, actually, example of system change. It's like you found <clears throat> your leverage point, you build it, and through that, that changed your entire system. And <clears throat> And I agree with Nicola around the time frame. And, and I think it's quite important when you start your journey and if you want to push and be more system change approach in USG is to be pragmatic and realistic, you, you know, and, and, and just bring one, bring two, have a go at it, but a lot of work needs to be done. So I'm looking forward for this community of practice to, to get together and, and just experiment. Yeah, Sharon. Yeah, to add. I'll really, really add that yes, it's 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 a hard one, and um, I love the idea of the stories because that is what we are as as Africans. Uh, we love storytelling. Um, much of our history is in storytelling, and um, yeah, I think we 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 need to stretch our vision in terms of what time means. I think it's very much the message that we've got from people that we've worked with on the continent that have managed to start from nothing and to create a new system or structure supporting communities. They just say it takes time. 
This one person, once she could tell us a story, she said, I've started 10 years ago. It takes time. And then, um, yeah, let me just rather just leave it at that. <laughs> you know, what is that question that that's chasing us um, to answer the thing now? But that's what corporates want before they fund anything, et cetera, et cetera. We need, we need to kind of broaden the way we just look at life, I think, and, and the... And the reality that we're creating. Yeah, thank you. I mean, your analogy to you know the storytelling is really important. I agree, and I don't know if any of you follow Dave uh, Snowden's work, the Cunniff and Sense Making Framework. And there, in his work, he looks at so how do and he doesn't look at measuring. He looks at how do we get less stories like this and more stories like that. That's how we measure the change from what people are telling us on the ground. And people are very sometimes uncomfortable with that because they want to put a number onto something. But he was very much like, we're just moving from stories like this to stories like that. <laughs> so, and I think we, yeah. we've got a, the, the, there are many very wonderful stories of things changing in South Africa and Africa. Yes. I think one, one huge um, leverage point could be uh, is finding those stories and getting them told. Mm. And that in itself will energize more change. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So I want us just to um, address some of the questions that we've been getting in the Q&A. Um, so the first one is about how do we integrate into other divisions like Sheik? Um, and, yeah, that's really important. I think Nicola was talking about that, about how, because ESG is so broad, and can be, it's just about every. So Nicola, do you want to take that one? Yes, with pleasure. Check is an incredibly important en element in any ESG program because it's got the S program. Check is about ensuring that you've got all the safe processes in place, that your equipment is checked and maintained properly. So, so when you're creating your ESG, this is management system. All your check elements are going to fit deeply in that management system, the ESG management system, and you are going to be putting data out of all the check type of principles, all your lost time injury frequency rates, all of that traditionally comes from your check departments. The check departments are monitoring waste control and pollution levels. So check is actually a vital element within in, in the whole ESG bundle. All departments, one must understand that sustainability affects absolutely everyone in the C-suite. From the sales function to the IT guys to the HR guys, it is across the organization. It doesn't belong in a siloed function at all. It affects everyone. And every decision that is made about anything in a company needs to consider the principles of sustainability and what the company has put forward. So it, no, it, it never sits on its own. ESG happens across every division within a company, if I can say that. Yeah, and Thank it's you. implemented by everybody, not you. It's <laughs> the sustainability, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, there's also, in the interest of time, I see some of the other questions. I'll come back to them if I can. But um, there's one here that I really want to raise and uh, from Andrew, which talks about innovation and the circular economy, which is emerging more and more and youth employment creation. And he's asking, how can we apply systemic change to tackle this challenge? So just a simple question. <laughs> That's a really complicated question. Thank you, Andrew, for raising it. I think it's a really good one. Um, anybody want to tackle that? I can I can maybe go on the, on the, I mean, the circular economy in a way is based around system change. So this one, I I, I feel like they almost embedded in it. But I'm more interested about, about the youth employment because I can give a, a proper example, actually. So we were part of a big African uh, process around youth opportunity in uh, system uh, food system change. So food system in Africa is huge. It's linked to agriculture, but it's linked to other economic sector. And the challenge was to say, how does we make sure that the development of the food system in Africa is going to benefit and create opportunity for the youth? And what so what it means is a lot of the system change is very valuable in the planning process. And it's about planning in a world of complexity 
and uncertainty. So in terms of applying it as a, one example is using, and I think someone used the word, uh, is using foresight approach, which is a system change process also in terms of planning. So it's not planning with what you know, but it's planning with what you don't know and planning using the extremity of what could happen. And what it does is it push you, and that's where you're bringing your stakeholder to help you to plan various scenarios and crazy scenario, probable, but crazy, to help you to, to, to understand how the world could evolve. And especially when you plan for youth, you plan planning for the youth today is almost too late. I mean, I don't mean to be like like doom and gloom, but but a sector is evolving. And, and if you want to, to change it, you need to understand how is it going to evolve and how do I need to prepare the youth for it? And so when you do this planning and the and this planning process it, with a system change approach, through this process, it helps you to understand the different parts that are relevant for the youth and what do you need from either a policy perspective, a technology perspective, a skill, an education, a banking, the different element that will optimize the opportunity for the youth and that help you to think in different ways and look at le different leverage points. And when we did that, we did it with the youth. So we didn't just got all guys and women like us, we got the youth in the room to really get them uh, to think and help us thinking through the planning. So I think using system change planning around ESG is a very powerful tool to, for you to also be, build a resilience and future proof kind of strategy that can evolve and adapt. Mm. And the scenarios you were saying, so important, thank you. Yeah. Anyone else want to add on to that question about the circular economy? Yes, Nicola. Um, there are a couple of years ago, there was a tender, and I'm talking many years ago, the tender that was cancelled by the government to formalise the waste pickers that are, are, are work particularly in Johannesburg and try and get them some sort of stability in income and pricing. Unfortunately, that was cancelled, which I thought was that not, not, not the right move. So from a policy perspective, we need to make it easy and almost mandatory to encourage recycling of every kind of a uh, kind of um, bit that we can. There are very few people who do recycling as a as a rule in Johannesburg. It doesn't happen. So it happens by companies who are going to landfills to pick things out, and that's not great. Encouraging the youth to 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 you know jump in it may um, involve education um, facilities throughout um, our schooling systems. I mean, these are just ideas, but I really do think that this kind of thing needs to be driven from the top, from government, from policy and a regulatory approach. We can come in and add finance and add people in volunteerism to educate the youth, but I think it should be structured from the top when you're thinking about a circular economy. We can do all do it in our companies and we'll often have a bring a, a, a child to work day, but that's not enough. That's not dealing with youth. And uh, I love Marie's idea about getting the youth to tell us what they think will, will, will be needed in the future. Thank you so much. Sharon, you want to add anything? Yeah, I just, um, the youth, you know, as much as we talk about buy in and you know getting people to to uh say what nicola said now we've got to speak to the youth to see what they need the same way in a corporation um buy-in is buying again sometimes can be a thing like you feel like like i'm going to get the buy-in from the bottom up but actually it's about going to the people and and getting the creation and, and they create the future um so i think for the youth they are suffering the results of our poor systems that we've created. Um, mm. So, and the big thing that we need to move past, I think we need to think beyond just, they must be employed. We must find a way to employ them. We need to empower people to employ themselves. Mm. Uh, we need to, and the thinking around systems change is very valuable in that. It's teaching people how to go through a process of this is where I'm at, this is a possibility. How do I work with that to get to something which can possibly be a job for me, creating my own work, and maybe I'll employ a few others. It's, uh, yeah, there's a lot of sort of um, more um, 
intangible things that we need to do with the youth. It's to change their belief system. It's to change them. Maybe we should just believe in them. That could, that in itself could make a difference. Because the youth are feel like they've been, you know, left mm -hmm. uh, left behind in our system. But we need to build that confidence um, or belief in themselves that they are their own leaders and they can make this happen as well. I know it's not as easy as that. But it's, it's, and it, it's a nice uh, segue into one of the uh, other questions from Prakashna on SMMEs. Um, so this kind of systemic change is difficult enough when you're a big organization. Um, for SMMEs, it's even more difficult. And for big organizations, to engage SMMEs in that system change is also quite difficult uh, because they may have really long supply chains and many, many suppliers. Any of the, um, and then there's also a question around, you know, how you're also engaging regulatory authorities to think like this. Any thoughts on that from anybody on the panel, SMMEs and regulatory authorities? I think it's quite difficult for SMMEs. SMMEs to engage regulators. However, if any of the larger companies, there is constantly an engagement with the regulator in order to understand the issues that you have with implementing regulations. There's also multiple um, educational initiatives, particularly in Africa and very strongly in Kenya, where you're inviting the regulators into your training academies to teach them about the future movement, the future requirements of the ESG and where it's going. So bring the regulators along the ride, along on the ride with you. And if you're establishing that rapport and learning together, then we, when you have a problem as an SMME, there is no reason why you going, can't go and talk to a regulator, understand how they expect you to implement something that is really difficult for you as an SME, either from a size perspective, capacity perspective, finance perspective. Thank you. Anyone else want to? Um, I was going to speak about ESG system change approach and SMMEs, not directly to the regulator. So I don't know if that's if that's relevant. Sure. Just just in terms of, and that's something I know that that is a big topic around ESG and SMMEs, and and what does that mean and how we do it. And, and I think to me it's it, it's a very interesting um, element. So first of all is how do we bring that knowledge and and that's and that understanding early on in the incubator of 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 SMMEs and startup because that's something that's not there. So you're starting a business, a lot of incubators start with all the financial element, but there is very little on the SG, there is very little on future proof your business. Uh, and there's very little on system change and how do you position yourself as a SMMEs. So that's my first topic. My first element is how do we make sure that all the support to SMMEs bring that element of ESG and system change and future-proofing SMMEs. Then the second point is, how do we have, and that go back to our stakeholder engagement and co-creation, is how do we change the relationship, the power um, between big business and SMMEs around ESG? And to me, it's understanding the role and influence of big business to see how do I bring SMMEs in my proposed value. So not just how do I skill them, but how do you how do I bring them? How do I bring them in my sphere of influence and power and give them more influence and power? And and what I, I mean with that, so let me like be completely blunt, for example. I'm, I'm I love to be challenging a bit. So for example, Nicola is a big is no, he's not EY, but you're a big company. <laughs> and I am a very small micro enterprise. And it's a question of how do you put SMMEs and big company together to actually start developing approach that doing it together is really much more impactful and transformative than if we were doing it separately. So I think there's a lot of potential on looking for partnership, not only public private, but big business and small business together and challenge each other and, and grow together in different way, more as a growing as an ecosystem that growing individual as business. So that's that I think also the, the ESG impact at a broader uh, ecosystem level. Thank you. Um, 
If there are no other inputs, then I think uh, that brings us to the end of our webinar. Um, from what I've heard, um, I think the discussion has has been a really, really challenging one. So thank you so much to the panelists. We've sort of tried to delve into this issue of um, systemic changes needed in today's world and ESG because it's cross-cutting, it's an essential part of ESG, but that it's not easy, it's people-based and so, and it's gonna take time and we're gonna have to make small incremental steps because ultimately we have to change culture and that can take an extremely long time. And we're gonna have to change the way in which we, our mindsets and the way, and that's gonna require new skills and competencies in our organizations, but also in the way in which we engage with stakeholders. And WEF has this, the World Economic Forum has this wonderful, I think it was written by the head of WEF, um, where they talk about stakeholder capitalism, where you see stakeholders as a value to you rather than, as Nicola was saying, a, you know, a little checkbox that you just have to go and say, oh, we spoke to them. But they do actually add value to it. And you guys have raised so many issues around that diversity and inclusion, innovation, and that, that that helps us at the end of the day to be more sustainable and improves our license to operate. And um, so it's something that I think is really going to only increase in importance in sustainability debates as we go forward. So thank you so much for that really rich and um, interesting discussion. You're all very passionate about it, as am I. And so um, thank you so much. And we hope to see you all at the... ESG conference. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. I'll hand back to Shannon. Thanks so much, Wendy. Yes, I really enjoyed that discussion. So thank you to everyone for joining. Um, we appreciate everybody's time. It's been a pleasure sharing the topic of systemic change and ESG with you. Before we wrap up, I'd like to extend my gratitude to our moderator, Wendy Poulton, and guest speakers, Marie Paramon Gurney from Sculpture. Sharon von Skulkveik from Ubuntu Lab Institute and Nicola White from EY Parthenon for an engaging panel discussion. They've all contributed to making this webinar a success. Uh, thank you to EY for their support in making this webinar possible. And if you have any further questions or would like to continue the conversation, feel free to reach out to us via email at shannon at And if you're interested in hearing more about the ESG Africa conference, please visit their website at www.esgafricaconference.com. With that, I'd like to bid you all farewell. Thank you for your time and goodbye.